Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This week was a nightmare. Even right down to this morning, trying to film this video as it was like my cats had decided that they wanted to join in and they're knocking things over. They're scratching out in their bathroom. They're meowing. I'm like, guys, just give me a minute. Come on, God. So we finally got it done. We got the setup happening and I guess I got the good news and the bad news. Good news, I'm still alive. Bad news, I was so sick last week and I don't get sick. Like I think probably in the last 10 years, I might have had two colds and that was it. And they might have been like 48 hours to 72 hours max. <laughs> so when I get sick, first off, I'm just like, what do I do? Oh my God. Like, how do I even survive? <laughs> because it's just such a stark difference. And I tell you what, it really makes you appreciate like when you've got good health, doesn't it? So I was feeling very grateful this morning when I woke up and I'm like, oh my God, I think I'm starting to feel better. <laughs> but it derailed my whole week. So I, uh, I guess I was away last weekend. I went to a first birthday party and was around a bunch of people. And I'm not normally around a bunch of people, honestly, like I'm pretty, pretty much a homebody. I don't really leave the house except for training. And, you know, I go out for dinner on the weekend, but you know, it's usually just me and one other person or a small group of friends. And we're not really around a lot of people. So I think I definitely picked something up that weekend. And um, first it was my boyfriend. He came down with it on Monday and I was like, oh, you know, Tuesday has passed. Nothing's happening. I'm like, yes, I've dodged a bullet. Stay away. <laughs> and then by Wednesday, I'm like, I really am not starting to feel so good. And then by Thursday, like the, the day was just like a struggle pass, trying to get through all of my client check-ins and truly like I hate letting people down. <laughs> so, you know, clients come first. I got through all of my work, but I can tell you now by, I don't know, 11 o'clock on Thursday night, I was sitting there like <laughs> shivering, I had like a high fever. I could barely breathe. <laughs> and I was convinced at one point when I went to sleep or I was going to sleep, like I'm going to die in my sleep because I'm not breathing. Like <laughs> my respiratory was so like affected by this bug or whatever it was. So, and I guess I grew up with asthma pretty bad as a kid. And I think the only times I ever really had an asthma attack were exercise induced. So I think I had exercise induced asthma, but also extremes in temperature. So if it's really cold and believe it or not, even if I have like a slushy, you know, those like thick, delicious, colorful things that you get at 7-Eleven. Um, if I have one of those and I sip too quickly or take too many sips, I guess just that cold in my throat my body's like panic attack, anxiety, we can't breathe. <laughs> so I've avoided those things for a, the better part of my adulthood. Or if I'm trying to train in really hot climates, I mean, that's the only other time that I have really struggled to breathe. And this felt like that. I went, I was laying down and I was like, I can't, I don't think I should lay down completely flat. I think I'm going to try and prop myself up. So I'm laying there in bed, semi upright, so uncomfortable, so angry, <laughs> just like fuming because I was like, I have so much to do and I want to be sick. And I was convinced I was going to die, but uh, <laughs> thankfully I didn't. I'm still here. I made it through, but not without a lot of frustration this week. So runny nose, it was just constant sinus pressure, headache, low energy. And of course, you know, when we're sick, no one's happy. So I was so grumpy over the weekend. Just it really had to try and talk myself like it's only, this is temporary. It's going to pass. You'll get through it. And I guess, you know, with such a big goal, you know, to work towards <clears throat> having to take a full week off training definitely was a little unsettling. I know that I've got lots of time. I haven't picked a show date yet. I know roughly when uh, I want to be, you know, at my peak, but it doesn't make that experience any more comfortable. <laughs> so yesterday, Sunday was the first time I woke up in the morning and I was like, okay, I think I got this. I seem to be not coughing and spluttering, which is a good thing. I don't want to pass it on to anybody. Otherwise I would have stayed home. So I was back to, you know, being able to breathe. 
But man, my energy level was still really, really low. But I managed to spot select a few exercises, which I'll show you. We have a look at my data today, kind of how I selected exercises to choose when I've missed an entire week. Like, is there a priority? How do you do that? You know, what should be the most important? Are we focusing on just getting calorie expenditure? Are we focusing on, you know, some heavy lifts? Like, how do you choose? So I'll talk a little bit about that when we jump over. And honestly, I just wanted comfort food. I was like, you know, my hunger is still kind of there. Obviously, when you get a cold, your appetite is a little bit suppressed. Um, but I was definitely still kind of hungry. So you'll see this week, I did still try to eat. And I know like part of my body was like food. And the other lean part was like, yes, feed me, please. <laughs> so <laughs> there was still that turmoil going on. Um, but, you know, I think it's really important to know when we get sick, especially if you have a fever. In fact, there are certain medical conditions or like post-operative conditions where we actually have an increased need for protein and energy. So obviously, as your body is trying to fight off that infection or it's trying to recover from a very inflamed state, i.e. having a surgery or something kind of major like that, our bodies do need more energy to, to work and to function. So I think contrary to popular belief, and I think a lot of people would think, well, I'm not doing any exercise or I'm not moving, so I probably shouldn't be eating my normal amount of calories. I would argue that if you've been really unwell um, to a certain point, you do actually need to keep fueling your body. So, you know, whilst I didn't really feel like I had much of an appetite, I knew that I've got to hit the ground running this week. I do need to get back into the gym at some point. I didn't want to push myself too hard. Um, last week, but I also didn't want to be coming back, you know, feeling really fatigued because I didn't eat an adequate amount of calories. So I definitely pushed in a lot of food that I didn't really feel like eating. But by last night, I was just like, oh my God, I just want to feel better. So I just said, you know what, I'm going to have my like my last supper, so to speak. And then I went down to, we have a really cool place called Burger Stop, which is like 10 minutes from my house. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with that franchise. They're not like a huge franchise, but they have the most incredible burgers, sandwiched handhelds, like just decadent stuff. Um, it's the most interesting combination of cool sauces and sides and ingredients. And then they have this inside when you go into the actual restaurant, they have this like, you know, the if someone comes around like the Mr. Whippy ice cream van or they're selling like, I don't know, fairy floss. What do you guys call it? Cotton candy in Australia. We call that fairy floss. <laughs> like when they come around in those kind of stalls, they've got one of those set up inside, but it's kind of like part of the furniture and it's all, you know, art deco and super colorful. And they do like all kinds of wild and wacky desserts. So previously I've been there and I've had like deep fried peanut butter balls. And then they have like these little milk shots with like all the fun flavored cereals here in the US. So like you could get, I don't know, what's like a Frosted Flakes milk shot or I don't know, insert anything like a cinnamon toast crunch, like giant thick shake or something with things billowing out the top and like donuts and cookies. It's just wild. So they have such cool food. And I was like, I've been pushing down all of this prep meals like for the whole week, <laughs> just like completely unimpressed and also couldn't really, couldn't really taste a whole lot either. I'm like, I just want something good. So last night I had, uh, I'll put it up on the screen for you. I had half of a pulled pork cheese melt. It had like three kinds of cheese. It was insane. The thing weighed like 290 grams for half, not the full sandwich, just for half. So it was dense. And then I also had half of a, like a smash burger, which had some really cool, I think it was like a Japanese, like Korean red sauce or something and all these fun ingredients. So definitely enjoyed myself last night. I also really love their soup, believe it or not. They have this tomato basil soup, which is like more of a pink sauce. So it's like creamy and tomato and it's like a rustic, you know, bacony flavor. So I was just like in my element last night, slurping soup, eating burger. <laughs> I'm like, look, I'm going to get back to it tomorrow and hopefully I'll feel better. And thankfully I do. I probably wouldn't be filming this video, that's for sure. So let's go and have a look at my, my data for the week. And I'll also address some of the questions that have come through on YouTube as well. So if you've asked questions, then stick around because I am going to go through those with you. 
Okay, guys. So we've got the data pulled up. I am very thrilled personally because I am sitting here on my new monitor. So I think one of the other things when I talked about earlier, you know, seeking out comfort, uh, because I couldn't do a whole lot of anything on the weekend, I'm like, I feel so unproductive. I have to do something. So I went and bought myself a new computer monitor, which I've been needing to do for the longest time because <laughs> my, and a new desktop actually, because I had the most dinosaur of computer monitors and screens. In fact, I was given the hand-me-downs in my previous relationship. So I'm pretty convinced that the monitor I had is from like 2012 and I could barely make out like a pixel <laughs> on my screen. I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but regardless, I couldn't see shit on my computer screen and my desktop was like from 2016. So it was having all kinds of issues. So I was like, okay, perfect opportunity. I wouldn't have done this unless I was forced to. So um, I am very happy that I have my new computer monitor. But anyway, um, let's start with the easy one, which is my weight. So you can see here on the screen, I apparently lost two pounds this past week uh, based on the data that was entered in. Now, I want to say there are three here that I didn't bother putting in. And the reason that I didn't put it, bother putting them in is because they were all artificially elevated. Um, and part of that is in response to me having a cold. So if we think about it, our immune cells or our immune system, rather, it releases these signaling molecules and they are called cytokines um, and they basically alert like other immune cells to basically create an immune response and they then go off and attack the virus that ever whatever it was that I had and we produce then antibodies and they bind to the virus and they basically prevent that virus from infecting any more like healthy cells and while all of that is happening we start to have those symptoms of coughing and sneezing and runny nose and just general like irritability but you know that is in response to our body attempting to eliminate that virus and during that time there is so much water retention. <laughs> so those few weigh-ins, I took a couple and I was like, again, back up in the 139s. I'm like, is this ever going to end? It's like period one week, cold another week. And then earlier in the, the prep, it was like my weight was going back up because I just started trading heavy. I'm like, I can't catch a break. So I'm trying to be patient, but it does look like it's come down. I did weigh in again yesterday on Sunday and my weight was a little bit higher. And I, I do suspect that as my weight was kind of trending back up here, I think that some of that might also just be due to the fact that I did exceed my caloric goal this past week. And like I said earlier, I, I, I didn't have a crazy appetite but I'm also still really lean and I'm still thinking a lot about food, though I didn't really have any taste buds. So, you know, it was kind of a boring, horrible week, but I, I ended up going over my targets a little bit. And especially on Sunday, like I said, we enjoyed a really nice burger and some hand, a handheld sandwich, super hearty. I also had a soup and I had some street corn that went with that. So I, I definitely feel like I just was needing something to kind of get me over the hump. So I'm hopeful that this week will be a little bit better, but I, I do think that my weight will have crept up, not only for going over my caloric target this week, um, but also if we come over and have a look at my training, as I mentioned before, I think at the moment, my resistance training was down, obviously appreciably. I've got to say, day one for me was a huge session and I was so proud of myself. I actually hit several PRs across some of the different exercises and that was kind of, you know, week five, it was instructing me based on my program and I've probably got it pulled up here. Let's go have a look. Yeah. So week five was up to an RPE nine. You can see here some of these exercises um, I've decided to call like push exercises because they're the muscle groups that I care about the most. So quite a few all time PRs in this particular workout. So I was very happy with 58. If we go back historically and have a look what I've been able to do in that day one full body session, 34. 37. Where's another day one? 36. I don't think I listed it here, but it was 40. So, you know, big increase on day one here. And I almost wonder, like, because I went so hard, I wonder if that kind of catalyzed me just getting sick or was the catalyst, I should say. But it doesn't matter. It's done and dusted. But totally sick here. On these two days, I, I wasn't getting the respiratory symptoms yet. I was just kind of a, a little bit lethargic and I was starting to get, you know, that sinus pressure and a bit of a headache. So I was like, all right, I don't think I'm going to be getting any better. So what I did is I still went and hopped on the stairs, but the intensity was really, really low. Um, I also haven't done the stairs since 
this prep or in this prep or for a very long time. So it was like exceptionally difficult. <laughs> so you can see here, the first time I hopped on, I went for 32 minutes and expended 335. That was tough. It really was. <clears throat> and then I followed that up with just a bit of a brisk walk instead. Um, and some of these earlier walks here, I did a 60 minute walk earlier in the week and did 12,000 steps, which I'm grateful for because it did help me get my steps up a little bit for the week. Uh, and then I came back in on, must've been Thursday. I only lasted 27 minutes and had to get myself off. And you can see like the big drop off in caloric expenditure. Like I was like, I think I did that whole session at maybe level nine on the stair meal where I usually would alternate minute on minute off with really high intensity. So I'll usually go one, one minute at like level 12 or level 13. So like by those last few minutes, I'm like ready to di di take the, the level back down to like an eight and then I'll do a minute of recovery and I'll alternate that for 30 minutes straight. Um, and so that it doesn't get so boring with every 10 minute like interval or window, I'll go from doing like single steps to, you know, taking two steps at a time. And that's not because it's magical. It's just, I get bored on there. So I'll like stick to the same, you know, single steps for 10 minutes. And then I'm like, all right, change it up, double steps, and then back to single steps for the last 10 minutes. Usually when I do that, just to pass the time. So as we can see, my volume is way down my caloric expenditure is about half or just under half so I do think that this week despite having a cold and having slightly increased or elevated energy and protein requirements just because I am a very active person they would not have you know cancelled one another out my exercise activity is usually substantially higher so I do think that this is probably just a bit of a week which is unfortunate but you know you can't help it and I I think this is definitely giving me, I guess, the motivation to make sure that I'm really mindful with how often I kind of go out and socialize and kind of subject myself to germs. <laughs> I know that sounds really petty, but I mean, that's the reality. I mean, if you're a top athlete and you're trying to achieve a pretty impressive goal, you've got to be really mindful about your health. And, you know, that doesn't just go for like getting sick, but I think like who you spend your time with and who you're letting into your circle. I, I've gotten so much better at setting better standards for myself, I think in general with, you know, if, if I am really time poor and I, I think I am, and I know a lot of you guys are probably too, um, I think it's even more important to be, you know, selective with who is, you know, taking up time in your day. If you've only got a couple of extra hours, I know for me, I want to be surrounding myself with people that are going to elevate me, that are, you know, way ahead of me. Like I love spending time with older people <laughs> because I just am like a little sponge and really enjoy that. But I know that's a little bit different from, you know, exposing myself to people, but in that same school of thought, I guess, I'm just really mindful of, you know, how much time I'm spending, you know, being social when, you know, I've got a lot of things I want to accomplish. So, you know, I think it's okay to say no. So this week I averaged 8,000 steps, which is great. That was part of my goal. Obviously my total caloric expenditure for the week is way down, but I'm honestly just excited to keep it going. And hopefully this week will prove to be another successful week. So I hope I can catch up. I won't be upset if I don't. I mean, it isn't the end of the world. So if we go over to my summary sheet now, and sorry that the screen is kind of split. This is a slightly different view, but if we go to this past week, my average weekly weight came in at 137.3. I was meant to be at 135.9. So again, from the earlier weeks, we discussed maybe me not actually being able to catch up to that because of the increased inflammation or that inflammatory response to my training, obviously going from doing very little to doing a lot, you know, I'm probably going to maintain a certain baseline level of total body water because my training is hard. So this, I might be chasing my tail a little bit for this, for the remainder of the prep, but as long as I can keep, you know, staying in uh, consistent with this 0.8 of a pound of weight loss each week, I'll be really happy. So we will continue to track forwards. Um, as far as I guess the questions from YouTube are concerned, let's pull this up. So I have here on the screen the previous videos and the questions. So the first question here was actually about essential amino acids. 
So I guess we can probably go back a little bit. I mean, there are nine essential amino acids, and these are really important for a, a wide variety of different processes and functions within our body. Um, the ones that are most important, I guess, from a resistance training perspective is leucine. So that's one of the nine essential amino acids. There are other things like valine, phenyl phenylalanine, tryptophan, and a host of others. Um, but leucine is the one that we care most about in regards to signaling muscle growth. I think in general, I'm not somebody that goes out of my way to, you know, have an essential amino acid because for the most part, I'm getting an adequate amount of these essential amino acids from, you know, hitting my daily protein. And if we go back real quick, just over to my current target. So if we go to my adjustments, I'm currently hitting around 125 grams of protein per day. And that's kind of right in the middle of the recommended reference range for protein. So if I'm hitting that total daily protein intake, and majority of my protein sources are coming from animal protein, animal proteins, which is typically where we get a very high concentration of all the essential amino acids anyway. Supplementing with a BCAA or an essential amino acid um, is probably, you know, wasted money, if I'm being honest. Now, there are certain situations where I think, you know, supplementing with an essential amino acid might come in handy. The first would be if you are a vegan or plant-based or you choose to have a dietary approach that is plant-based because of the, I guess, inferiority of the amino acid profile of most plant-based protein sources. That would be a scenario where I would say, yes, definitely get an essential amino acid. You know, now you're actually giving yourself an opportunity to get, you know, a good two grams of leucine or your optimal amino acid profile through supplementation. And then the other situation where I would personally start to consider supplementing would be is if I am very lean and I've been dieting for a long time and maybe I've had to not only make a couple of sacrifices to like my overall, you know, energy intake, but at some point, you know, if my calories were to get low enough and I haven't had, won't, well, I haven't had to do this yet and hopefully I don't, but historically I've been under the pump to get to a certain level of conditioning for competition. Or maybe if you're somebody that's dieting and you're doing a photo shoot, it could be for anything. You may have had to actually start to shave a little bit off the top of your protein to get your calories down because you might already be bottoming out at your carbohydrates. Um, just as an example, I work with quite a few females and some of the ladies that are kind of pushing it to, you know, to get stage lean, whether they're a competitor or not, it doesn't matter. It's the same process. Um, for some of the smaller females, their daily carbohydrate intake might end up being down at like 75 and their fats would be at the very lowest that I would prescribe, which is probably somewhere around 27 to 30 grams. I wouldn't want to go much lower than that because you're then going to start to sacrifice essential fatty acids, which are really important. So, you know, in those instances, sometimes the person isn't lean enough and they want to be leaner for this competition. So, you know, I'll say to them, well, you know, by making any more adjustments, we're going to start to potentially compromise your capacity to maintain your lean body mass. We could take some calories off the top of your protein, but now we're kind of bringing your protein levels down, which isn't optimal. So in those situations, I would say if you're at the tail end of a fat loss phase, you're on very low calories then supplementing with an EAA probably wouldn't be a bad thing. And the other scenario, which also falls in suit with dieting, is if you're somebody that's practicing intermittent fasting. I tend to do this a little bit. Again, depends on where my calories are. But if I'm getting down to the wire and the gnarly end of my calories, which might be like 11 or 1200 per day, it's not a lot of calories. So I might fast until noon and then I have like an eight or a nine hour you know, eating window to kind of save up the rest of the calories that I do have. But I'm also kind of foregoing many hours. So think about it. When I go to bed, maybe at midnight, I'm not eating until 12 the next day. It's 12 hours in a completely fasted state. So in those situations where you might also choose to intermittent fast and you're not getting, you know, immediately available protein uh, and perhaps you're working out in the mornings, it might not be a bad idea to supplement with an essential amino acid to just make sure that there is some leucine available in that immediate post-training setting. 
Um, otherwise, you, you may not necessarily have any immediately available leucine to kind of facilitate that process, not without kind of starting to break down your own existing um, you know, protein reserves, aka your fat-free mass or your lean tissues. So I hope that that kind of gives you a little bit of insight into the question around essential amino acids. Um, I think if you're at maintenance or in a surplus and you've got a good amount of calories uh, and you're eating, you know, a, an animal-based diet or an anim- um, a pro- protein, your protein intake is coming from animal-based sources, then I don't think that having an amino acid, an essential amino acid supplement um, really offers any additional value. Um, okay. So the next question was about my training regimen, just being full body rather than a classic split. So it's a really great question. Part of the reason, and again, I know I've talked a little bit about this, but perhaps from a slightly different angle in previous videos, I'm only able to get into the gym four days a week at the moment. I'd love to be able to train five or six, but I, I can't. I mean, on the weekdays, especially, you know, I've got lots of meetings on Mondays and Fridays and I, I have to basically start work as soon as I get out of bed. Um, there's no time for me to do it in the mornings. And historically, you know, someone might argue, well, why don't you just get up and do it at like five or six in the morning? I'm also working through to like midnight most nights because we've got so many irons in the fire within our company. So, I mean, that would give me, what, four hours sleep? No, thanks. <laughs> so I tend to kind of work late. So I do want to, you know, make sure at least I'm getting six to seven hours sleep. So that's also not, you know, a feasible option for me. So four days a week of training and with such high training volumes. And again, I just want to pull us uh, our attention back over to my weekly breakdown. So for me to get optimal growth, I want to be up in the twenties for the muscles that I care about. So for me, again, just as a reminder, that's my shoulders and glutes. I'm hitting 24 working sets on these two muscle groups. Um, and then I'm doing, I guess, a conservative build volume is how I would probably describe this. So for somebody that is an advanced or a professional athlete who's been lifting for a long time, 15 working sets per week is probably, you know, going to signal or elicit maybe some mild growth, but it's certainly not going to be as good, in my opinion, as going up to say 20s in 20 to 30 range. Uh, and then everything else kind of tapers down from there in order of importance. So still already that's like 39, 40, let's round it up to 40 exercises. I've got to do a lot of work within a very short four day time span. Now I can try to spread those days out if I had, you know, the perfect plan, but I don't, I cannot coach. I mean, I cannot train on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays because I'm working. So I'm really limited to Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So my days are four days back to back training mostly. So with that being said, you don't want to be doing like full lower body days where you're doing, let's say 15 up to maybe 20 sets on just my lower body, particularly if it's the same muscle group. What the research would tend to suggest is that beyond say nine, maybe 12 working sets within one training session, any more on the same muscle group is kind of junk volume. So I think what's more important is to be able to kind of spread that volume out pretty evenly over the course of the week. If I tried to cram this in into three days, it would be almost wasted. Um, I'd still be burning calories, but you know, the additional sets, maybe sets 15 through to 18 or 20, 21, depending on how I've worked that program, those additional sets on those same muscle groups aren't really going to be giving me any additional hypertrophy benefit based on what the research would suggest. So I want to try and spread these out as much as I can over the course of those four days. So that's why I do full body. Otherwise, if I was to try and do all of my glute work, if I've got eight exercises and I did those over two training days, for instance, that means that I'd probably be doing anywhere from 12 to 15 sets on my glutes in one session. Half of those sets are not really going to be giving me any additional growth benefit. So yeah, kind of the, the spacing per over the course of the week is also really important. So I hope that that gives you a bit more sense as to why I am doing full body at the moment rather than that classic split, just because I'm limited by my training frequency. The last question was about my metabolism. Let me see if I can scroll down here through the comments and find it. I oh, yeah, here it is. Okay. Could you talk about how you knew you were metabolically in a place to start dieting again? Did you go through a reverse diet in order to enter into another fat loss phase? So I guess I'll start with that and then respond to the rest. So I took <clears throat> not 
by preference, I was kind of forced into doing nothing all of last year. So I separated from my ex-husband in October of 2022. I was basically kicked out of the businesses, told to get out of my house, go fend for yourself basically. I had no access to any of our marital monies, a very small amount. And then I basically had to start my businesses from scratch. So I worked you know, for six years trying to build up all of these products, which we did successfully, and then they're all taken from me. So obviously we settled very recently. So, you know, for 14 months though, I had nothing. So I had to start again. So I was building a new company, which is our new team beer body, which is our all female coaching team. And we have allied health and then, you know, writing books, trying to work on building our new app, getting a new temporary app because I wasn't allowed to use my own app, which was just ridiculous. Like I cannot believe that happened. So yeah, I had to find like a new app really quickly to put all my programs on so that I could still serve my clients make an income. Uh, it was wild. So for most of 2023, I was basically just in survival mode and going through, I guess, a pretty horrible divorce process. So I, as far as my training is concerned, I, I didn't really get to train. It was like, if I had time, I would go to the gym but there were so many other things that you would consider urgent and essential. So my average training frequency from most of 2023 was probably just two days a week to maybe three if I got, got lucky. But I wouldn't say that they were of high quality. The training intensity was probably like a seven at best. I was really distracted, obviously very stressed, a lot of financial pressure, and then just, you know, business setup is extremely taxing. So yeah, I, I guess I was not really tracking macro. So again, because of that circumstance, I stepped away from tracking altogether. I didn't have time. It was like, that's such a time consuming process that it didn't make sense for me to keep that habit. So I, I'm not really sure what my caloric intake was during that time frame. I made a point to try and eat protein with a couple of meals a day. And that was about it. I just eat a meal and that was, you know, I didn't give a whole lot of thought to it. My diet was terrible. So it's been nice to kind of reintroduce like all of my veggies and like my good fun recipes and things again. But I'd say, you know, was I in a good place metabolically speaking? I don't know. But my current calories have been, you know, pretty modest, I'd say, in terms of I've still been able to successfully continue to lose weight. Um, at least I can see it in the mirror. Maybe the scale hasn't reflected it. But I think, you know, overall, I, I have to say maybe I was in a good place because there was, you know, hardly any binge or restrict happening like that because I, I wasn't tracking. I wasn't trying to diet. I was very much just whatever goes, goes. So I think my maintenance calories probably got up to around 2000. I don't know that I would have built any muscle during that time frame, So I wouldn't have improved my metabolic rate. And we know that there's that close association with your BMR, with how much lean tissue or fat-free mass you have. So it wouldn't have gotten any better, that's for sure. But I definitely didn't have any dieting interferences where sometimes we kind of go into this binge restrict cycle and that can often, you know, nudge people's body weight up over time if that happens, you know, really consistently. But typically, yes, I would put somebody through a reverse diet and I would be aiming to get the calories up to, you know, well in an excess of 40 to 45 calories per kilogram of lean body mass as an indicator that they are, you know, they have a robust and healthy metabolism. So then the next thing that you asked here was, have you experienced any weight fluctuations throughout your competition years? Did you ever hit a point where your body wasn't responding to dieting and what was your approach? Oh gosh, yeah. I think I've been through multiple phases of dieting and muscle building phases. 2020 was my biggest year of, I guess, building. I spent most of 2020, I guess that was COVID, just going for it. And I did my Get Lean and Train With Me programs, um, which is a four-part series, I think 16 weeks in total. And I repeated that actually a couple of times. Not my preference or not my preferred way to do things, but I was very limited with my equipment at my home gym. So I kind of just made a couple of tweaks here and there, changed out a few few exercises, but, you know, stuck to that structure. Uh, and it was very heavy focus on building my lower body glutes, especially, and maybe quads, arguably. So yeah, I've done lots of building phases. And when I build, you know, my weight goes up by like 30 pounds. So I like right now, we know my weight sitting at like 137 in the peak of my builds and during 2020. And then there's been other periods kind of throughout there. 
um, where I'll let my body weight kind of go back up to 150, 155 at my highest. And I'm probably sitting just over 20% body fat, which, you know, it's uncomfortable for me as somebody that's normally, you know, when I compete, I'm down around that, you know, 11 or 12% body fat. But it's also really important to like give yourself a break and, you know, you can't build muscle out of nothing. So if you're expecting to stay lean year round, and put on muscle. It's just a very slow, I won't say impossible, but a very slow process. You know, you need to have energy available, whether that's in the form of like visible body fat, your adipose tissue, or calories coming in from the diet to, you know, be able to build the foundations, build the building blocks of that muscle that you're trying to grow. So yeah, lots of those kind of big cycles in my weight. So yeah, I, I'm all, I range anywhere from as low as 130 when I'm getting on stage, really lean all the way up to 155 and I'm happy anywhere in between there though. I say, I like to feel fit and I know as I'm nudging up towards that 150 range, I don't feel very healthy. And I think now that I've kind of done a couple of those big heavy building phases, I wouldn't do those again, but I'm glad that I did. But I also just recall not really feeling, you know, very fit. But I think also I didn't prioritize keeping in any, you know, maintenance cardio for my cardiovascular health. And I think that could have made a big difference. So yeah. And then you asked if I ever hit a point where I was not responding to dieting. Oh, absolutely. You always hit plateaus. There's always going to be a point where you, you reduce your calories and you eventually get to a point where your caloric intake, what you're taking in matches what your body is expending. And at that point you have to make an adjustment. You make an adjustment to more movement or less calories or a combination of both. I often find that the combination of both is a little better. So yeah, you, you, I always reach those points. And in fact, you know, we've just seen with my data, um, over the last couple of weeks, things appear to be kind of stagnate, stagnating. I think I've had a couple of bad weeks or frustrating weeks. I shouldn't say bad, just weeks with lots of interferences that are kind of masking my progress. But I will get to a point here probably in the next seven to 10 days where I'm not going to be making any more progress if I hit these calories and I'll have to make another adjustment. It's not fun and I'll have to make probably a 10% adjustment to make sure that I get a nudge or the needle moves. But, you know, I can also do a pretty specific mathematic calculation to, you know, determine exactly how much of a calorie deficit I need to create to achieve 0.8 of a pound of fat loss. And we can do that through diet or I can do that through added in additional exercise. Although... <laughs> I will argue if you've got to make, let's say like a 250 calorie adjustment to in, to result in say 0.8 of a pound. Again, I'm just throwing out a random number. You can either do that every day through restricted calories, or you could do an extra 250 calories worth of exercise. That's actually a lot harder than you think. I know when I get on my spin bike, I mean, when I'm going as hard as I possibly can, like it's a hit session and I'm dead at the end of this. I dread them. Um, these 30 minute spins where I'm burning 366 calories Men, if I have to make an adjustment of 250, that's essentially like me doing another HIIT class every day for about 20 minutes. So you can see where, you know, reducing your calories and bringing that number down might actually be a little bit less difficult, especially if you're somebody that's time poor. So I think that's everything that I had to talk about for the questions. I know there were lots more comments here, but I think I answered most of those. So if you did put a question in, please go and check. I did respond to most of them. Um, but then lastly, I also have something for you guys. So I know in week one or week two, I shared my chicken korma recipe with you. And then I had this meatballs one as well. And then I did my homemade stuffed crust pulled chicken pizza. I have another couple for you for this week. So if you go to the link to description or sorry, the description, there is a link uh, where you can download this and you'll get all the previous weeks that I've given away some recipes. But I do have a a FODMAP friendly taco recipe. FODMAP, for those of you who don't know, is, I guess, a fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, and polyols. These are, I guess, compounds found within a very wide variety of different types of foods, fresh fruits, vegetables, you know, breads, grains, and cereals, dairy, you know, they're kind of sprinkled in throughout, um, but they contribute to quite a bit of gastrointestinal discomfort, particularly in people that are suffering from IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. Um, I have that and I really struggle with garlic and onion, which I love. It's so depressing because it tastes amazing, 
But this particular recipe is a FODMAP friendly one, as are nearly all of mine, because I don't want to eat onion and garlic. So this is a great taco recipe. I've got all the macros and ingredients here listed for you and even a little grocery list at the end. And then I also have another recipe, which is like a breakfast burrito that I made one of the mornings. Uh, I've got a picture for you there that you can probably see on the screen. Um, and I've got all the macros and the ingredients for you if you want to give any of my prep recipes a go. And then don't forget to also check out on our website my all my book selections. We have tons of, uh, I guess, macro-friendly recipe books. I've also got my recent publication, the book, The Complete Exercise Guide to Muscle Hypertrophy. That has so much incredibly like detailed information from things uh, relating to the mechanism of how a muscle grows, how much muscle we can grow naturally. And then I also talk about all of the different types of training techniques um, that you often see kind of implemented in the practical setting from recovery time to blood flow restriction to you know range of motion, partials versus lengthened. There's a whole host of things, training volume, periodization. There is a chapter basically on each of the really kind of key important subjects that we often see people speak about on social media. And I go into quite a bit of detail and break down like a different study. So I kind of, here's a study, here's you know, how they did this study. And then here's my summary of this. And then I do that for multiple different studies within that same area. Uh, and then provides you like an overview of how to apply this to your training. So that's a really great book. People that have read it and have provided us feedback have said that it is better than any course that they have done online. So I, I see that as a really good thing. I'm really glad that people are finding it helpful. So Go and check out our books. And then last but not least, if you are interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, I am still taking on one-on-one -on -one coaching clients. I take on a little less at the moment because of my busy schedule, but we also have our entire coaching team here at Team Be A Body. So all the links to our website where you can get a hold of everything from free PDF downloads, progress trackers, free workouts, free chapters of my book, and then all of our products and services are available on our website. So thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that this is a better week coming up. I feel like the last several weeks, I'm just like, ah, oh, guys, this sucks. I'm sorry. But hey, it's it's the reality of, of doing a prep and trying to get to the Olympia. So hopefully I'll have a better week and I look forward to chatting with you then.